This is Rick Matson from the University of Washington Shoulder and Elbow Service. We're going to talk a little bit about how to do a total shoulder with particular reference to glenoid component selection. When we select a glenoid component, there are really two considerations. One is what is the geometry of the surface, and the second is how is that component going to be fixed to the patient's bone. A little bit of math here for you, but in general, shoulders are stabilized by what we call concavity compression. That means that we have a concavity or a cup shape here to the socket. We have a force that presses the ball into that uh, concavity and that resists a displacing force. And we can determine the uh, stability by dividing the force that's stabilized by the amount of compressive load. You can imagine that if this socket was flat, it wouldn't matter how hard we pressed in with our load here, we'd still be able to move the ball across the table. Think of a, a cue ball on a hard wooden table no matter how hard you press down on it, someone would still be able to displace it. Yet if there was a little concavity in that table, then this compressive load would be much more stabilizing. So we call that the stability ratio, the displacing force divided by the compressive load. Now, one of the things that we talk about is that when you take the ball and you displace it out of the socket, it doesn't go straight out as it would if it were on a tabletop, but because there's a cup shape, the center of the ball has to climb out of the center as shown here. We call this the glenoidogram. And so this is what the glenoidogram might look like for a very constrained shoulder. And you can see that if we do the, the math, we see that the stability is greatest when the ball is in the center of the socket. So this is the stability ratio when the ball is in the center of the socket, we're at the deep point of the glenoidogram and at the peak of the stability ratio. But as we get out toward the edge of the component, the glenoidogram flattens out and the stability drops away to virtually nothing. So when we look at component design, there's a little bit of a trade-off and the difference between the curvature of the ball and the curvature of the socket is referred to as the mismatch. So if you don't have any mismatch at all and there's a little displacement of the ball, it's going to load this rim and contribute to either glenoid loosening or glenoid rim wear. So this glenoid would be very stable but also very unforgiving of any translation which may occur in the patient's activities. So most components now are designed with a degree of mismatch, which means that the ball is, has a slightly less curvature than that of the socket. And that allows for a little bit of translation without rim loading. And that comes a little bit at the expense of stability. So here would be the stability in a completely conforming ball and socket. But here, where there's a bit of mismatch, it's a little bit gentler. But what we get for that is less problems with uh, rim loading. So our research has shown that a six millimeter a diametral mismatch is the, an ideal combination between mobility and stability. Now let's think a little bit about the fixation. In other words, how do we take this surface and hook it onto the bone? So some systems are designed with smooth pegs and these have to be cemented into position and don't have a lot of resistance against uh, pull out because they're smooth. Other systems have used a keel, which again is relatively smooth, and again it doesn't have a, a rigidly defined geometry, so exactly how to get the geometry of this keel and the hole in the bone and the surface all lined up can be a challenge. Some systems have a combination of metal and plastic. Here, for example, we have ingrowth pegs, which seems like a good idea, but we have to keep in mind that the material properties of plastic and metal are different. So there is a risk uh, of failure between the metal parts and the plastic parts. Similarly, in this case where we have an ingrowth metal surface here, 
and we know that bone can grow very well into such a surface, we have this transition zone here between the, the plastic socket and the metal bone, which again is at risk of failure. We also need to keep in mind that the shoulder is a three-dimensional thing, and so it's probably best not to just have a single point of fixation here, but rather to have anterior and posterior fixation to help resist liftoff in the event that rim loading takes place. <clears throat> when we compare some of these different designs with a keel, because it doesn't have very precise way of fitting the component to the bone, surgeons often have to use a fairly large amount of cement to fill the void between the component and the bone, as shown here and here. In the smooth pegs, again, the geometry is more precisely defined, but the pegs don't have any retentive properties. So the design that we favor is one that actually has ingrowth pegs in this, in, an ingrowth peg in the center of the glenoid, a surface into which uh, bone can grow, as shown in these uh, slides here, where you can see that bone has actually grown in between the, the flutes of this um, uh, fluted component, helping fix the component to the bone without cement. And here's another cross-section again showing bone growing in between the flutes of this fluted central peg. So this is the design that we um, use. It has, as we talked about before, a six millimeter diametral mismatch. It has these fluted pegs that you can see here, and then it has peripheral pegs for additional fixation. And here is an example of a case two years later, and if you look carefully, you can see that there's hardly any cement there, and there is these white lines here which show the ingrowth of bone into that central peg. Thank you.